Since the beginning, Houdini was seen as the go-to software for effects and simulation in big VFX productions. If you needed explosions, a tidal wave, or collapsing buildings, you would need to use it. And this reputation hasn't gone away over the years. In fact, over time, side effect layered many new features that made it even better. So what started as a focused simulation tool is becoming a platform that touches almost every part of the production pipeline and in different industries, not only in VFX, but also in animation, game development, and even motion graphics. The story of this expansion is less about a sudden shift and more about gradual steps toward taking the launch of other 3D software. So on the surface, it looks like Houdini is replacing some aspects of 3D production that used to be done in other 3D software. Or is it? Houdini always leaned on simulation. Unlike tools that added physics later, Houdini built its workflows around procedural rules and node graphs from the start. This made particles, fluids, and rigid bodies not just possible, but also predictable and reusable over many times. Once you had the network, you could pass it around, tweak a parameter, and rebuild a shot without redoing everything from scratch over and over again. This built once reuse everyone mindset ended up being the seed that carried Houdini into other areas of production. For example, in game development, as games grew bigger and open world games became the norm, the usual workflows started to feel slow and outdated. I mean, hand placing thousands of props or sculpting terrain variations by hand was slow, repetitive, and hard to change later in production. But with Houdini Engine, studios could import procedural assets directly into Unreal or Unity. Instead of exporting static meshes, they could bring Houdini digital assets or SDAs with sliders and parameters exposed. A level designer inside Unreal could adjust the width of a road, regenerate a forest, or tweak building styles, all without leaving the engine. So Houdini did the heavy lifting, and it did it in the background and sent the results back to the game editor. This is a big advantage, because you don't need every game designer to be a Houdini expert. A small technical art team can build the assets, say a road generator or a modular building tool and hand them to the team of environment artists to populate environments with everything they need and they can do it on the fly. In addition to having the flexibility and procedural systems that can help them do the work really fast. Sinofax has actually shown this off in their demos, like Project Pegasus and Project Titan, where small teams built entire island maps inside Unreal Engine using Houdini assets. Terrain, foliage, cliffs, villages, and road networks were all generated procedurally and state editable through Houdini Engine. This kind of workflow is especially useful in open world games, which are popular nowadays. One input curve can become a full road network, complete with guardrails, signage, and vegetation adjusted to slope. A single forest generator can scatter trees, rocks, and undergrowth with rules that adapt to elevation or any biome type, rather than manually creating dozens of variations of each asset. One Houdini setup can produce endless results, while changing just a few parameters. Compared to more traditional tools like Maya or Max, where modular design often relies on hand-placed models or simple scattering systems, Houdini keeps everything non-destructive. You can change a rule once, and the entire level updates. As someone put it, Houdini is like the modifier stack of Max, but you never have to collapse it. It is not like Houdini replaces other 3D tools. Studios still rely on Maya and Max for modeling and animation, especially for hero assets and characters, or Houdini shines is scale and iteration. A Maya built-in skyscraper can be scattered across a Houdini-generated city grid with automatic variation, and a max model prop can be distributed in hundreds of locations without repetition. So in practice, Houdini complements these tools. Maya and Max handle handcrafted detail and character animation, while Houdini automates the bulk and makes large-scale edits painless. In addition to this, in 2024, Sinefax pushed even further with Project Copernicus in Houdini 
which is a new GPU accelerator system for material creation and texture generation. It is essentially a rework of Houdini's old compositing context, which was rebuilt to act like a procedural material engine. Copernicus takes obvious cues from Adobe Substance Designer, but integrates directly with Houdini's 3D workflows. As an artist, you can layer PBR textures, blend masks, and generate nodes or patterns in a node graph. Then preview the result directly on geometry in the viewport. Since it runs on OpenCL, the feedback is interactive and doesn't rely on a specific GPU vendor, like NVIDIA for example. So I think the intention of side effects is clear. That is to give Houdini users a built-in alternative to substance tools for procedural texturing. The funny thing is, side effects even provides guides for substance users, mapping designers' nodes to Copernicus equivalents. The advantage isn't that it replaces substance overnight, whether it be painter or designer, because they are still the industry standard in addition to Mari, but it keeps everything in one pipeline, which is convenient for many VFX houses. You can build a material inside Houdini, apply it directly to procedural assets, and send it to the Unreal Engine through Houdini Engine which is great for game developers. Right now, and this is obvious, Copernicus doesn't match Substance painting features. It is stronger in layering and procedural generation, at least for now, but for studios already using Houdini heavily, having textures in the same environment could streamline things in a big way. Another big development in Houdini has been character animation. An area long dominated by software such as Maya. You see, side effects introduced skin effects in Houdini 18.5 and has been expanded ever since. The idea is to make Regan an animation procedural, just like everything else in Houdini. Skin effects treat skeletons as geometry, which means joints and rigs can be manipulated with the same tools used for meshes. In practice, this allows things like automatically tagging joints, this lag, this wing, and so on and having Houdini build the correct rig modules, IK solvers, effects chains, spines, blend shapes, and so on on top. Setting up a basic rig becomes faster and more modular as a consequence. Because rigs are procedural graphs, they can also be reused and retargeted easily. Side effects has shown rigs being transferred between completely different characters, humans, birds, quadrupeds, and so on, without starting over from scratch, and recent updates added Apex Animate, which is a high-performance evaluation engine for rigs, along with scripting tools for technical animators. This brings features like ragdoll posing, animation layers, and procedural motion blending closer to what Maya has offered for years. This being said, Maya is still the go-to for animators. Its node graph, viewport manipulators, and years of polishing make it more intuitive for keyframe animation. Houdini's strength here is flexibility, especially for TDs and technical animators, when it comes to retargeting, crowds, procedural blending, or integrating characters directly with simulations. In practice, many studios mix the two, animation in Maya with motion or simulation done in Houdini. In a different field, Cinema 4D has long been the king of motion graphics, not only in day-to-day -day tasks for freelancers doing gigs online, but also in Hollywood when it comes to digital screens, holograms, and sci-fi facts in movies. But in recent years, I would say the last decade, Houdini has been steadily catching up to Cinema 4D in motion design space by blending its procedural power with tools that motion artists actually want to use. While Cinema 4D built its reputation on being artist-friendly with MoGraph and quick iterations, Houdini has been lowering the barrier with self-tools, in addition to new setups tailored for motion graphics and direct integration into pipelines like Unreal and Redshift. The big difference now is that Houdini's procedural workflows let artists create far more complex animations and motion graphics, like thousands of clones, articles, or abstract forms, while still keeping everything non-destructive and customizable. This flexibility is making motion designers who once relied exclusively on Cinema 4D seriously consider using Houdini, especially for projects that demand scale and experimentation, which is usually done in big movies, and especially knowing that these studios already use Houdini anyways. Looking at this all together, you can see that Houdini identity has been shifting over the years.
of course it is still the strongest tool for a fax and simulation, but it is also becoming the backbone for procedural environment creation and a fax in video games and a growing powerhouse in motion graphics, and hopefully in the future is gonna even help in animation. And to answer the question asked in the beginning of this video, from what I can see, Houdini is not really taking the launch of 3D software. I mean Maya, Max, Substance, and so on. If anything, it's gonna make it more convenient for studios and other professionals, I mean in different industries, whether it be game development, VFX, or motion graphics, it's gonna allow them to streamline their workflow, doing everything inside Houdini, which is gonna be more convenient. In addition to doing more complex things in a shorter period of time. But for people who don't like Houdini or don't use it in the first place, I think this is not gonna make much of a difference. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to this channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.